All right, everyone, welcome. 96 Boards, Open Hours, sponsored by Lenaro here today. This is our 37th episode, Going Strong. It's good to see a lot of familiar faces in the call, as always. And today, I don't know if, if you've all, or if you follow up on the website or, or, or uh, you know, our announcements. It's kind of a, it's a pretty laid back episode, right? We're going to kind of hang out here. Uh, talk about some interesting things that happened last week or this last weekend. And hopefully I can walk you through some fun stuff uh, as well as some little roadblocks that I came across while at a hackathon um, with some students. And so this is all kind of based around 96 boards and the things that people experience when they have 24 hours to execute something. What are the issues that, that people come across? And, uh, and of course, anyone is welcome to speak up and ask questions and get involved we're we're all here to just kind of chit chat i mentioned it before the before the the call was starting to be recorded but um as you can see i i'm 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 starting to kind of have fun with these penguin arrangements now that i have so many thanks to mark bolzer and mad dog who uh, frequently join us they sent me some really cool linux penguins and uh and so i've been having fun with that great another thing that we will talk about today is GPIO access and uh, Python wrapping with the Libsoc libraries. I have Andy Doan, who's on the call. Uh, I'll probably call on him in about five or 10 minutes so that we can walk through some of his sample codes that he's written and then um, express uh, the, some of the issues that we found most recently and how we hopefully intend to fix them. Great. All right. So I guess I'll, I'll kind of open the floor here before we move on and I just start babbling about stuff. Did, did anyone come with questions? Did anyone want to bring up a topic or, or, or just kind of ask one of our devs on the call something? Nada? Okay, great. Well, so then I guess I'll jump right into what I was going to talk about. This weekend, we had a great hackathon at, at uh, UCSD. So that's University of California, San Diego. And it was a lot of fun, 24 hour hack, 24 teams showed up and checked out 96 boards, or I should say more specifically, this was sponsored by Qualcomm. And so all of the, the teams were using Dragon Boards. Now, what was the hack about? Well, it was a smart homes, uh, smart home uh, hack. So you found a lot of the, the students trying to, you know, manipulate actuators, um, sense uh, some sort of input through a camera because, you know, you want to find out who's at your front door or whether or not it's a stranger or, or, a, or a friendly, right? And there were some very interesting projects that popped up uh, at this at this hack in, in just a 24-hour period. Very cool stuff. I mean, there were students coming out with, with uh, facial recognition using OpenCV, not just, not just facial recognition or facial detection, right? It was actually uh, uh, recognition through through a, a database of pictures, images that they provided the system, and then it would know whether or not a friendly or a or a stranger was approaching their door, and then it would act accordingly, either sending a text message to the the owner's cell phone, or uh, or just immediately locking locking down the entire house, right? Uh, so that was really cool. Uh, in, in the near future, we will be uh, uh, pinging these students and their teams to provide all of these projects that they, that they put out, all their hard work. I hope that they'll continue the progress in building out their projects and then posting them up on 96 boards uh, projects page, as well as the Qualcomm Developer Network projects page. As these start to surface, we will get them up there. I'll, of course, announce them to you all here. And, and then hopefully we can even get them on the show to demo some of their cool stuff. Yeah, so it was also just brought to my attention right now that I, I didn't make a certain announcement. And this was because I forgot. Yeah, last week, <laughs> last week we had the ST Micro electronics team come on the show and, and uh, talk to us about ESD protection, system level ESD protection. And right after the show, I went off and released a blog and also uh, posted the video on YouTube, of course. But Maybe we can get that blog shared in the chat here uh, for those of you who haven't seen it yet. Um, uh, uh, I would suggest giving it a, a read. It's interesting. 
And, and then we also got some questions popping up on the, the YouTube page. So around that. And for some reason, I am not able to open any websites right now. I don't know why, but I'm kind of stuck at that. So if anyone's sharing websites with me, I'm just unable to open them. So I can't share. Uh, if, if you wouldn't mind sharing the video from last week, that'd be great uh, on the chat. And then as well as the blog on 96boards.org slash blog from last week, that'd be cool. If anyone wouldn't mind sharing that, unfortunately, I'm, I'm at a stalemate here. Yeah, so uh, the question that popped up, though, I think it was if there was any recommendations for ESD protection around and it was around a particular use case. And I promise you, I'm going to if you're watching this, whoever commented on there, I'm going to pass that question on to ST team and I'll have them go to the YouTube channel and answer it. Yeah, so if you go to this blog page, which I can't go to, the very latest blog was on last week's episode. So you check that out. Great. Okay, so like I said, we have Andy Doan in the call. And before I ping him directly, I just wanted to walk through this one thing that I've, I've talked about probably, I don't know, I want to say five or 10 times. But at this point, you know, to dig around 36 hours of open hours material, it gets pretty tough. But I'm going to share my screen here. So let me know when it goes up. Let's see, share. You can see all the stuff I have open. Right here, uh, you should be seeing three terminal windows. And these terminal windows have different purposes right now, but um, uh, I'm gonna focus on this one right here for now. And this is just kind of bringing back the idea of basic GPIO manipulation and understanding the underlying uh, 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 paths that the different libraries are taking while accessing your GPIOs as well as kind of digging in slightly deeper into the 96 board specification, which I'm also going to touch on real quick here. So if I, I, I actually I actually can't because see, this is what's happening to my, my windows. Uh, everything is going like this. So I can't, I can't get <laughs> 96 boards, nothing, nothing's happening. I'll have to fix that. Okay, I won't touch on that. But if you, if you, if you recall, Okay, you look at a 96 boards, and, and I'll, I'll actually turn the share screen off right now so I can show you. But you're looking at a 96 boards right here. I got a dragon board. And we're focused on this low speed expansion header right here, right? So if you hold it up in this direction, you know, you have the pins from left to right, uh, which is going to be one, two, and then as you go down, three, four, five, six, et cetera, all the way until 40. The GPIOs on here are logged from pin 23 to 34. and a lot of students during this hackathon were like, why can't I just export, <laughs> excuse me, why can't I just echo 23 greater than export, right? Well, because pin 23 doesn't relate to the GPIO value according to the operating system that you're running on whatever 96 board you're working with. Now, just taking Debian, for example, on the Dragon board. So the Debian operating system made by, you know, the Naro, uh, uh, the Linux Debian distro that we have up there that you would download and flash currently the most update version 1609, you are going to see that the GPIO value that is linked to pin 23 is in fact GPIO value 36. Okay, so this is going to make more sense when I go into this terminal and start showing this, this off. I have a dragon board hooked up right here behind me. It's running on this screen. And then I have the terminal that's SSH into this board behind me but and i have some sensors and noise that's going to output there either way uh so pin 23 is linked to gpio 36 right well pin 23 according to the 96 board specification is gpio a right so this is where it gets confusing right 23 is gpio a gpio a according to the debian distribution on dragon board is gpio 36. so that's where we're getting at right now putting that back up here. I'm going to share the screen. And again, this is just kind of GPIO basics, but uh, uh, you're, you're going to find your GPIO folder. So I'm going to just go into the shell here. So super user access, I just type sudo su. You can see it's the same thing, but now I have a little hashtag there instead of the dollar sign. So I'm going to CD into my sys class GPIO. And you can see I have all the little chips there. 
I already exported GPIO 36, right? But if I wanted to just kind of get rid of it, I could just echo 36 on export, right? So now it's not there anymore. I want to bring it back. I'll just export it. So now I have my GPIO 36. I'm going to CD into the GPIO 36. This, remember, GPIO 36 is linked to pin 23, right? Which is GPIO A. So if I have my sensor mezzanine hooked up, it's going to call it as GPIO A. So if I look in here, I have various options, right? Active load, device, direction, edge, power, blah, blah, blah. Okay, the two ones that I'm going to use right now are direction and value. So I can cat and find out what my direction is for the GPIO. It's set to in. Safe, good. All right, I'm going to change that. So I'm going to echo out direction. And then what you can see now is that my direction has been changed to out. Okay, great. And just so that I can get some noise here, I'm going to move my sensors around so that I have the buzzer on GPIO A, which is GPIO 36. So now I'm going to change the directions by cat, sorry, value. So if I cat value, you'll see that it's set to zero. But if I echo one value, then it's going to start buzzing. Right? So that's just the basics. I'm now I'm setting it back to zero, turning it off. Okay. Now each one of these GPIOs are linked, each one of these pin numbers, 23 through 34, are linked to different GPIOs, right? So for instance, you saw if I CD out of this, go one directory up, you'll see I have GPIO 15 there. Well, GPIO 15 is linked to pin 24, A, B, C, A, B, C, B, E, 26. So uh, essentially, I'm saying that uh, that they don't really correlate. They don't go in, in any particular direction. That's just what was that's just what was set and figured out in some at some other level, all right? That I don't that none of us really had a choice on. Okay, something popped up in the chat. Let's see here. Audio seems to be gone. Not sure. Can you hear me? Can anyone hear me still? I can hear you, Robert. Okay, great. Yeah, so another question. Okay, great. Thank you. So another question popped up here. It says, hi, Robert. I guess we will get the details, but how do I know if any of them do OpenCV in C++ or Python? Um, can, could you, could you um, kind of explain that question a little more, Rajan? Yeah, that was about uh, the hackathon uh, OpenCV projects that uh, they did at uh, UCSD. I just wanted to know if they did it in C++ or Python. Oh, okay. Yeah. So at the hackathon, and I'm going to unshare my screen just real quick while I talk about this. So at the hackathon, there was there was a big variety of people programming there. There was people using the Libsoc library, with which is kind of catered mostly to people who like to program in C, right? One team, the, th the team that got first place actually figured out how to use the Python wrappers. Um, they said it took them a lot of work, which is kind of why I brought Andy here to talk about. But after troubleshooting some, we're going to tell you that <laughs> it needs to be fixed a little bit. Then there were other people using LibMRAA with UPM, LibUPM, and they were programming in C++, right? Also, I believe there's a Python wrapper. I don't know if anyone was really utilizing that. And then some people were just doing shell scripts. Like they were just kind of what I just did right now with the GPIOs. They were just writing shell scripts and having export, turn up high, sleep, all this stuff, just using Bash. Now, um, uh, Lib MR, MRAA also has a C interface. You can do C++ or C. Yeah, so David actually did a lot of work. David and Andy both did a lot of work with these libraries. Um, and I guess I'll, I'll pass the mic over to you guys uh, right now in a sec. So let me share my screen real quick. That's probably a good point here uh, to, to start talking about this particular section of the uh, of the uh, of the, the the Python stuff, right? So, Andy, hi, how are you? You muted? Maybe you're muted. You leave. I'm gonna unmute you, man. Andy, can you hear me? Let's see. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you now. So, so okay, Andy. Okay, one second. I can't hear you guys. So. Oh, okay. Well, 
He's got his mute. He's got his death metal going on in the background. <laughs> okay. We'll just do it this way. Um, can you yeah, hear sorry us? about that. Yeah, I can hear you guys now. So, um, yeah. So one thing I was going to tell you, I just posted in the chat window, just for uh, terminology's sake. I, I tend to refer to these things as you have the GPIO pins, which are the things out on the board that you can connect to. And that's what, like what we're calling A and 23. And then you have like the GPIO IDs, which are like actually what, you know, the CPU is seeing them at. And that would be like 36 and stuff. That way, when we're talking, I, I tend to just talk in pins for 96 boards because, you know, GPIO A is the same across um, Dragon Board, High Key, whatever. So, um, yeah, Robert was saying that people were kind of wanting to see how to access uh, the Python libraries for uh, Libsock. Um, they're really easy to install on a 96 board. The first thing you do is uh, app get install Python dash Libsock, and you'll have them there. Um, the top level kind of Python uh, uh, module for that is called uh, Libsock. And then, um, as you can see in this example, Robert's sharing, we just have a really simple um, example where I had hooked up on uh, pin E, I put a LED, and then on uh, pin A, I actually put a little button. And this example here is simply when I, when I press the button, the LED turns on, and when I let go of it, the LED turns off. But the uh, kind of key uh, things there you can see is on line 16, and this is somewhat kind of Python convention. This is uh, kind of the entrant. This is how the script knows you're kind of executing as like a um, as a script or a binary, not being used as a library. But I I create the LED GPIO object, and Libsock in, includes a, a library where you can just instead of having to refer to it as GPIO ID 36, I can just say, give me pin E. And it does the mapping for you. And then I tell it what direction I'm going to want that in. Now, on line 17, where I'm talking here, at that point, that LED, it's just a Python object that's uh, living in memory. It, it hasn't actually toggled anything on the pin yet. And I do the same thing with that uh, button there below it, where I create a off GPIO A, I say, okay, this is going to be a um, configured as an imp as a uh, interrupt, and I take it on both edges, going up and down for the signal. And then at that point, I call main and I pass both of these uh, GPIO objects. So this is where things get interesting. On line 17, or sorry, on line seven, there, that actually starts to do things with Libsock. It that request GPIOs goes in and for each GPIO that's passed to it, it instantiates those things. So the things Robert was doing on the command line a second ago where you export the GPIO, set the direction, it basically does those things. And just, this is a little bit Python specific, but line seven, that with statement is what they call a, a context manager in Python. And the nice thing about that is when you exit that context manager, Python knows how to clean up whatever you've instantiated. So it basically unexports the GPIOs and all that stuff. So you don't have like, um, like in Robert's example a second ago where he turned the uh, buzzer on. When it leaves that context manager, it's gonna <laughs> export that so the buzzer would turn itself off. So it's just kind of a nice thing. They, uh, um, a easier way to understand line seven is kind of a, like opening a file in Python. You could say with and then open of the file. And then when you exit that block of code, the file automatically closes itself. So you don't leave a open file descriptor. But anyways, at that point, then we're pretty much the classic, uh, you know, GPIO examples. I just have a, a loop that runs forever. I, uh, I pull the um, interrupt. That 100 is just to say pull up to 100 milliseconds. And if nothing happens, let out, you know, let out of the uh, of the pole. That, that way, you could potentially do something else in the loop if you were interested. But then, basically, if the interrupt was hit, you go into line ten there, 
and I just say, you know, if it if we've gone high, turn the LED on. Otherwise, we've gone low, so turn it off. So that's just how you get the uh, toggling going. So all that's pretty simple. Um, the thing that I uh, will mention now, we, we have a, a bug in, I, I think it's in the packaging for our uh, Libsock package right now. And there is a pretty easy workaround. I guess I can uh, paste it into our chat here. For the Python libraries to work, you need the uh, command. I just uh, pasted into the window. Um, Libsock, the somehow we're expecting things to be in user lib libsock.so, and that's not where the uh, shared library is getting installed. But once you have that, then Libsock bindings work for Python too, and you're off to the races. So if I test it, so, so we were testing we were this. Testing this. You know, a little bit of echo. You well, I'm all right away. But so we uh we were testing this right before the call, Andy, and we were trying some other stuff. If I that that wasn't working, do you think this this might work or no? Or is I, pretty I, high chance? you got a 75 percent chance it'll work. <laughs> okay, I'll, so if there's time, I'll call it 80. I, I actually just ran it on a uh, on a on an ARM server, and you can import the library, so I think it'll work. Okay, so if uh, if there's time at the end of the call, maybe I'll try running this. And essentially, I already have everything hooked up here. And I think on this end, I have GPIO A set as my uh, my my button and GPIO E set as my buzzer. So everything's already hooked in. Um, if there's time at the end of the call, I will I will I will try to run this and test test Andy's Andy's fix here and then hopefully it'll become more generic by uh at some point cool andy no that's awesome i, I appreciate you touching on that because um because there has been that that was a big bring up for one of the teams they said they spent hours on just trying to get the python wrappers working for libsock but i wanted to ask you one more thing and if you wouldn't mind sharing some links because again i don't know what the heck is wrong i'll have to, like maybe what uh what Tyeth said I should maybe reset uh, my my DNS, but so if whatever I can do there to fix this, I'll just probably restart my computer. But could you would you mind sharing the uh, the other links that you shared with me earlier? All of the different sample codes on your GitHub and the sample code that you had at Jack Mitch as well. I think you just posted the ones from Jack Mitch. Yeah, so there you go. GitHub.com slash Jack Mitch slash Libsock slash tree slash master slash test. And then you have the same thing, GitHub.com uh, Done AC slash 96 boards examples. And um, there's a very complex one here that, um, that we're not going to walk through, but you can see this also has, uh, uh, there's some code here that walks through the, the LCD screen that's provided in the Grove sensor kit. So this is just another big chunk of code here that will give you samples to work with if you try to, you know, mess around with some other stuff in the sensor kit there. Great. Stop sharing. Back to this. Excellent. So now, did anyone come up with, did anyone have any questions around that? Um, did anyone want to talk about anything in particular? Uh, okay. Cool. So just to let you know, I will provide uh, all of those links as well as uh, the the all the links, the, the, the special command that, that Andy just provided in the uh, the mailing list that that we'll be sending out tomorrow. And if you haven't noticed already, we have been sending these emails out every week, and you can sign up if you are interested at www.nsigboards.org/newsletter. Slash digest. And we are almost we're almost at a thousand subscribers already. You made a nice example on how to handle GPIO and Coursera in Android. Yes. We uh so we talked about this that one time before. Um let me see if I can pull this up because I have a little bit a little script. For those of you who have tried programming GPIOs in and uh like kind of what I did on the basics. Uh, with uh, just command line, 
you'll notice that you know you go sudo su give yourself su super user access and um super user access oh yeah i typed it wrong thanks for fixing that Taya. so so super user access then you can manipulate the gpios right well with android there's like this layer in between your ability to access your io and your application layer so when you create an application and you want to access the, the io your application isn't allowed to and so we've made this like real really silly way to access it and by no means is it is it you know something that you should probably do on a regular basis but i'm going to open up this uh spreadsheet real or not spreadsheets presentation and go to the the slide and i guess i'll share it and i can't open it okay so something's really making me frustrated can't open anything but uh i will share one more thing here since i already have it open Yeah, so basically what John Mark is saying is that with Android, what you do is you go, you need to have the, the, the Android debugging tools, right? So you have to have ADB, you ADB into your shell, and then there's an init file. So the init file, it's a boot script that whenever your, your Dragon Board boots up into Android, this init file hits at the end of your boot sequence, and it just executes everything in this file. So what you do is you use ADB to export that file onto your host machine because Within the ADB, within the Android shell, there really is no text editor. You export it onto your, your host machine, and then you insert this small script at the end of the init file, the boot script. At the very end, what it does is it runs it, it exports all of the usable GPIOs. After it exports them, it sets them all to out. Then it, then it, yeah, then it ch mods. <laughs> So this is the bad part. Then it ch mods all of your GPIOs to 777, right? So basically giving access to the entire world and and their and their family members, right? So you, you don't necessarily want to do that, right? You can figure out your own permissions, but we were just messing around with it and and we set all the GPIOs to 777. That gave access to the application space within Android for you to manipulate I/O. This this helped us out big time when we wanted to create an iPhone, not an iPhone, we created an Android app on, an, on a phone, and then we communicated via Bluetooth to another application on the Dragon Board. Then the Dragon Board had various sensors hooked up to it, so we were able to, to manipulate and retrieve uh, data from the I.O., right? That was, it was really cool, uh, at least, you know, while it, while it lasted, and, and that's, I think, what John Mark is talking about. <sighs> okay, so back to real quick, one more thing that I think I'll share, and this was talking about, yeah, so the example is on Coursera, and I'll I'll, I'll share that one more time in this week's newsletter, I guess, uh, the Coursera, but yeah, if you go to Coursera.org, and you search for, some, like you can search for US, UCSD, IOT, and then each individual course, right, if you want to audit the course without having to pay, you can search for the individual course. So one is, I think, um, they'll start popping up there. But if you if you click on the specialization, so UCSD IoT, and then there's like a multimedia course, there's a, a communications course, there's a sensing and actuation course, and there's over 500 videos on combined on all of these. So you just search around, you'll find all these UCSD IoT. And you go in there, you can hit enroll on the left side on the like sidebar, enroll. And then this pop-up comes up and it wants to charge you money. And then at the bottom in this little, little letters, it says audit. If you click audit, then you can take the course for free. And it's all on demand. So you don't even have to wait for the course to start or anything. You just immediately start watching videos. So right before this, on that note, I was talking about this mailing list. And this is where I want to really ping people into participating. I'm glad I already had this opened. But here is the, the mailing list that I've been, you know, having some fun with. And, you know, full disclosure, I tried originally, I wanted to make this mailing list like kind of a, a you know, weekly newsletter covering everything 96 boards. And it turns out that that's actually pretty tough to do. So instead, what we're doing is we're calling it a, a open hours mailing list. And this is a once a week mailing list, just semi as a reminder. Um, also fun ways for you to interact with the community as well. 
So, you know, my email is, is open to anyone who wants to throw things my way. But, you know, first first episode, you just get, you know, have a little introduction. We're taking submissions for pictures of the week. So all you have to do is just send me an email with a cool picture that you've been interested in or that interests you. And like here you can see the little 96 board sticker. So I just thought that was funny. And, uh, you know, links to the open hours, countdown, adding to your calendar, news, various uh, little bits that pop up throughout the week. Uh, some some new projects that pops up that pop up and then any recent forum posts so anything that's been active for the past seven days i'll put it here so you can see where the where the live where the people are are most interested in and then of course instructions for how to contact and submit so that was the first that was the first episode right and then the second episode or the second issue of this um I was trying to be funny here, but yeah, so and bears, oh my, right? So this was the this was the hackathon over the weekend. This was our little 96 boards booth. Next door, we had the Qualcomm booth. They were the main sponsors there. Actually, they were the big sponsors. I think Arduino gave some boards as well. But, you know, links, Bickley Digest forum to sign up. Uh, this was a link to the hard hackathon. This is a little picture of the workshop that we did. The, the uh, oh. A little, uh, a little picture of the workshop that we did the, the week before. Again, open hours, what's happening this week, what happens in the next week, and then news and projects and then support forms. So, you know, it is interesting, I hope entertaining a little bit, and we are prompting people to, to get involved. So, I mean, like we do want people to, to start, start uh, submitting stuff. What was the tiny green board in the foam? The tiny green board in the foam. Oh, are you talking about uh, on uh, right here? So if you're talking about on this section right here. So yeah, here we have a dragon board, a dragon board, a dragon board, a dragon board. <laughs> As you can see, I have a lot of dragon boards. And then we have a bubble gum. This, this one right here is the uh, sensor mezzanine. And I, I don't have them out right now. Oh, I have the sensor mezzanine hooked up to my dragon board right here. This is uh, uh, the most current sensor mezzanine. This is the high key from Circuit Co. And that's actually hanging right here. So it's the same thing as the high key from, from LeMaker, except these are the people who made it first. Uh, then LeMaker ended up started making making them afterwards. And this is the high key from LeMaker. So high key LeMaker and high key from Circuit Co. Kind of an old picture. There's been more boards that have released since then. You can see them behind me. Uh, yeah. So that is all I have for you guys today. It's all it's all done. You, you can go home. You can go home early. <laughs> yeah, I'm just kidding. But so, is, were there any other questions, Rajan? Did you want to bring anything up? Is there anything going on on, on your end that you want to talk about? No, nothing much. I'm just uh, looking at a couple of things. Uh, the reason I asked you about the Open CV is I'm looking into kind of. Uh, using uh, C++ and OpenCV kind of on the dragon board trying to see if I can use the GPU and kind of the the performance improvement of using the GPU versus not using the GPU used for OpenCV. So now I'm expecting a lot of improvements when they when they release the 1612 I believe the Debian mm -hmm. 1612 mm -hmm. but this last week, I actually sat down with a friend of mine and started messing around with with the with the with the uh, uh, OpenGL, OpenGLES, um, trying to trying to get some graphics going. And the, the way I was doing it was I was playing around with with a, a game emulator. So I have this. I already talked about this, obviously, but there's the, there's this little um, case that was given to me by Lawrence King that clips on to a little smaller case that you can just you know toggle like this, whatever. Um, I wanted to make a, a little mini arcade. And I was downloading this, or I downloaded the package Hygan, which is H-I-G-A-N, and call to all people who want to help. But I could not for the life of me get the frame rate up. I mean, we tried. It, it's, requ it, it's requesting OpenGL 3.2. We found a way to just trick the system into thinking that it had 3.2. But then you're getting like 20 something frames per second, right? Which is not what the Dragon Board should be getting. The Dragon Board should be capping out at the frequency of the television that you're using. 60 frames should be what it should be getting. And uh, from what I've been told so far is that there's a translator between OpenGLES and OpenGL. And this 
issue might be in the in the uh, translator between those two those two the, those two scripts or code sources, I guess you would call it. And so I, I've already brought up the issue. Hopefully, we can start addressing that slowly to accelerate that. But um, I don't know if that answers. You. You're talking about OpenCV, right? I don't know how OpenCV utilizes the, the graphics. In, in, Minority. Yeah, it's there's a way. There's a way in OpenCV. I think uh, C++ supports kind of handing off some of the computation to GPU. Uh, they have a library for for handling that. But I think Python doesn't support support that. So that's why I asked you if somebody had done OpenCV with uh, in C++. So I think in in OpenCV, if you look at their uh, kind of examples, they kind of say that oh Python. Uh, OpenCV on Python, if you implement it, doesn't uh, handle the the graphics very well. It kind of doesn't. It makes the CPU do all the work. It doesn't hand off some of the uh, computation to the GPU. But C, if you use C++, then there are ways to do that. There are ways to kind of call the GPU into action in C++. David just shared a, a link to the Qualcomm Developer Network. Uh, uh, the the home automation and I think I, again I can't open it but I think this is the old home automation project made by I think it's Tasia and Matt from Qualcomm yeah. at the think of it lab they have a full-blown instruction manual for it so but yeah but they're using Python oh yeah so that's what I was gonna say a lot of people that I noticed they were all trying to use Python and they were yeah. that it through that yeah that's I, what I, I, I actually haven't article. read sorry I actually haven't read too far into that Qualcomm site, but it specifically said they were using OpenCV uh, to speed up uh, facial recognition and things. So it might be a link worth looking at. Yeah. Yeah, I've gone okay, through I'll that. I'll take a look at it again, but what I've noticed is most of them have used Python and it, it works fine. It works perfect, but it it doesn't call upon the GPU. So I just wanted to see if I can find out a way to Kind of do a comparison between uh, between those two, between doing it on the CPU versus uh, kind of using using that additional resource that we have on the board. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And uh, I, I mean that I don't know if you've gone through that exercise. I, I'm pretty sure that's the link that that uh, David shared. But that exercise is is pretty cool. I mean they they do it at the Think of It Lab. That's the kind of that's the big pamphlet that they give you. Mm -hmm. Have you had a chance to try it out, Rajan? No, oh, okay. I mean I have the home automation one running. I'm not sure if this is the same one. It, uh, sends text, it, it basically detects it detects faces and then it sends a text. Yeah, yeah, I have that. I have that one running. Yeah, on my board. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah. So I, I've but that, that one is in Python. That one I've yeah. I've looked at it. That one is, is in Python. Yeah. So as the students from this hackathon start to surface more, because I'm in contact with them. We should have about 13 projects being submitted at Qualcomm Dev Network and 96 boards, and I'm working with I'm working with all of these teams right now. So, so um, that's kind of the the idea that yeah. we get projects submitted, and then at another level, I want to pick out some of the best ones, and then hopefully provide them with the Dragon Board, with the promises that they develop that further. So I'd like to see them take what they made in 24 hours and turn it into something amazing over the course of maybe a month or two. A month or two. Yeah. yeah. So see what they can come up with and then they can showcase it here and provide better documentation, instruction sets for the Qualcomm Dev Network projects page. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we'll see. Maybe some of them did use it. I, it for the most part, some of the more amazing projects, as, as you would imagine, didn't need much of my help, right? They came with an idea and the knowledge to get this stuff done. So, uh, yeah, that, that was pretty cool. Yeah, I wanted to make another announcement real quick, unless anyone obviously is welcome to speak up. This was something I, I wanted to talk about here. Uh, so February, coming into February, right? Like open hours, what are we going to be doing? And I had a really good meeting. Christine and I actually had a really good meeting with the folks from Canonical that work on Ubuntu Core. And for those of you who aren't familiar with Ubuntu Core, it's a it's an operating system that was designed specifically for. Uh, actually, they refer to at Dragon Board 410C as their reference ARM reference hardware. 
<clears throat> for their this particular Ubuntu core image. It's fairly new, available at, at, on the 96 Boards website. If you go to the 96 Boards website, Consumer Edition Products, go to the Dragon Board, you'll see on the right side a link that takes you to Ubuntu core instructions. Anyways, the folks over there started a show similar to this. <clears throat> and their show is called Testing Days. It's a semi cross promotion for their show, right? But testing days happens every Friday and they're gonna be sparking it back up. They did four episodes in December. They're gonna be doing more episodes in February. We're teaming up with them. So we're teaming up with them to push out some pretty cool stuff next month. Uh, I know that uh, for sure, I will be on their show on the 10th of February. We're gonna be talking about Ubuntu Core on the Dragon Board 410C, flashing it on there and getting set up. Now, for those of you who are here for last connect, right? Right around the times that connect was coming up, which for us this year, this, this time is the first and second week of March. We're gonna have a three-part series, maybe a four-part series leading up into there where we focus on Ubuntu core. And I'm really excited about this one because they have some really cool stuff set up uh, for, for 96 boards in general. So what we're going to do is, and this is tentative, tentative, don't hold me to it, but the announcement goes that we're going to have folks from Ubuntu showing up on the 16th. They'll be giving us an Ubuntu Core 101, right? So for those of you who are interested in Ubuntu Core, what it is, how it works, uh, well, listen to the developers directly. That's on the 16th of February. The 23rd of February, we're going to do an Ubuntu Core 101, but for 96 boards. So we're going to talk about the different um, boards that have Ubuntu Core operating system available, and then focus primarily on the Dragon Board 410C because it is their reference platform, and we will be uh, tackling that with the developers themselves. March 2nd, wait, did I skip one? March 2nd, March 23rd, March 2nd. Yeah, so March 2nd, we're actually going to have someone come on to the show and run this really cool kiosk demo. So they have the, you know, similar to like the Apple store, right? They have something similar to that for Ubuntu Core where you just go in and you download these things called snaps where they're, they're, they're their type of applications. So we're going to give tutorials on that, talk about uh, maximization and how to get the stuff that you want running on your, uh, your Ubuntu Core. And then March 9th, yes, March 9th, that's live in Budapest. So we'll have a community panel set up. Um, the participants of the panel are not yet 100% decided, but uh, we will have probably Lawrence King. He was there last last connect at the, on the panel. So if you have any questions about that, um, there's going to be a, a gentleman from uh, uh, from Canonical that will be sitting on the panel, and then most likely uh, folks from within Lenaro that work on the 96 boards team uh, to you know just take general questions. So that's my. That's my big announcement for, for February. So you can look forward to February 10th, participating in testing days. It's a very cool program, actually. They do a little, it, it gets a little more, I wanna say hands-on technical in a sense, uh, uh, but it is all focused around, around Ubuntu only. And then 16th, 23rd of February, 2nd and 9th, we're gonna be doing a full run, full blown series, on, on on Ubuntu Core and uh, and your 96 boards, so that should be fun. Oh, and David, got you in the call, right? Did you leave? No. Yes. Well, you did tell everybody to I'm go home. <laughs> what do you need, Robert? Oh no, I was just gonna say. I mean, did you want to talk about next week and what we're gonna be releasing tomorrow? Uh, well, I can briefly throw out there. So there's a uh, a longer blog entry coming out um, that is on setting up a home DL DLNA server. Uh, we had done this as a demo uh, last year at ELC for Qualcomm. I've rewritten it um, so that it's more uh, human friendly than just some sketch notes on how to set up a demo. Uh, and I'm running it here at my house. And I've been successful in um, hooking up my Mac, my Linux laptop, my Linux desktop, uh, my uh, smart TVs, my Riku, um, 
Windows machine that my wife uses, um, a bunch of other stuff. So it's, it works reasonably well. Um, if you're interested in having one set up in your house to share photos, to share videos, to share um, audio uh, files, uh, music, et cetera, um, have a look at the blog when it goes out tomorrow. Um, and then next week, early next week, Robert will put out for me either on Monday or Tuesday, a short blog talking about the series of sensor blogs that are coming. I've gotten a bunch of sensors ordered. They should wander in my door next week with fingers crossed. Um, no guarantees uh, between UPS, FedEx, and US Post Office. Things take variable amounts of time. And I, I've tried, quit trying to second guess when they're gonna actually arrive versus when they say they're gonna arrive. So at any rate, that's, uh, that's coming. Um, the blog is uh, on the uh, DL on a server is kind of fun. It, it, it works real well. I mean, I've been able to um, share videos and audio files and graphics around the house. Um, it works on all my smart TVs, which I was quite shocked about. The only thing that was an utter failure, and I have to admit, I'm trying to get it to work, was uh, my TiVos. They don't do DL DLNA yet. Although supposedly sometime this year, they'll come out with a plug-in for that. Um, but I'm not holding my breath. At any rate, it's not really needed. The TV works perfectly without it. So I, I don't need to run it through a TiVo. That's about it. <sighs> Great. Awesome. Thanks, David. Uh, so. Oh, and I did send you all the pictures, dude. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. I just saw that in the email. For some reason, I'm able to load any pages that are already open. I just can't open new pages. So I'll have to troubleshoot that. Either way. You got uh, too many open. You're swapping, dude. You think that's it? I really do have a lot of pages. You're out of memory. You are flat out of memory. That's what's going wrong. If you've done a really good trick, you may even used up all of your swap memory. I've done that a time or two with with too many pages open. Shoot. Yeah, this is a this is an issue. <laughs> so. Yeah, it's called put you know put 64 gigs of RAM in your machine, dude, or otherwise close some windows. I have a, I have only only I think eight gigs of RAM, and this is a, this is a semi gaming computer, you know, like otherwise I wouldn't even be using Windows. I, I would bet dollars to donuts you you've used up all your RAM and you're and you're headed into the into the Windows version of Swap L. Yeah. Yeah. Anyways, great, awesome, thanks, David. Thank you, uh, Rajan. Did you have any? Did, did anyone else have any announcements? I know that Shovan, uh, Shovan and Christine. Did you want to talk about Connect or anything? Otherwise, I think we're going to end it at that. If you guys haven't booked it, you can still book your ticket for Lenora Connect. I'll push the link over here. We got some. We got. We, got, we announced a couple more speakers uh, on the website, so you can have a look at them over here. And make sure you all come by. Lots of nice yeah, exposure, exactly demos, and sure. sessions. Thanks for reminding me, Shavon. The other thing is, we're going to have a trade show booth at the Embedded Linux uh, show. Yeah. Um, so if you're if you're going to the Embedded Linux show, uh, make sure you stop in on the show floor. We will have a booth there. Yeah, ELC Oregon, right? Is in Oregon this this time? Yeah, it's in Oregon. Yeah, Portland. Portland, Oregon, Embedded Linux conference. Great, great. So then I guess uh, final announcements are: thank you very much, everyone, for coming to 96 boards. Uh, stay tuned. Next week, we're going to be talking with David after we release the blog. Uh, David Mandala here. He's 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 a local community manager, not local community com community manager lead uh, for 96 boards. So he'll be talking to you about um, all of the all of the stuff that we push out in the blog uh, with with regards to the server that he created. Uh, and then uh, we'll push on for the following weeks, where we'll be talking a lot about Ubuntu Core, getting stuff up and running messing around with a bunch of cool stuff on, on the various 96 boards uh, up until Connect, right, Lenaro Connect. Besides that, feel free also to, you know, go push yourself over to the newsletter that we've created that's, you know, centric around uh, the 96 boards open hours program. 
This is our means of getting information out, reminding you of the links that we covered during the show, as well as what's coming up next and what happened before, right? So uh, make sure you sign up for that newsletter, newsletter, n6boards.org slash newsletter slash digest. It's just posted in there and uh, follow us on Twitter at 96 boards. And if you feel so inclined, you may follow me as well at SD Robert W. So uh, we look forward to seeing you next week on to the after hours. Thank you very much, everyone.